Welcome back, everybody, to the Blogger Bowl preseason previews. Today, we are talking about the one-year fever dream that is this iteration of the Big 12. For one year and one year only, you get a league that features Texas and Oklahoma, as well as Central Florida, Houston, BYU, and Cincinnati. I'm Dan Weiner. That's Matt Rooney. Matt, how you doing? How's the old tire on the car? Oh, it's finally fixed. That hopefully that situation appears to be finally behind me. That was a that was a headache this morning, uh, but it's done with. It's over with. Um, you must be feeling pretty good because you get the. I know it's a Big Twelve preview, but it's probably half the show will be a Texas preview, and then we'll get into the rest of the conference. Would be my guess, knowing knowing where you're coming from. Um, I, I have. I think I have some hot hot uh, Big Twelve realignment takes as well. Ooh, interesting. I don't know. I don't know I, we'll we'll get into that though because we got a we got a, a whole bunch of teams to preview, and obviously. Like you said, the elephant in the room, much like we'll get to with the Pac-12. This is the last year of this current iteration of the Big 12. All right. So, as we did yesterday, we will take a look here at the ESPN SP Plus preseason rating for the teams in the Big 12. And there you see at the very, very top of the board, as you take a look at this, one thing should probably stand out to anybody watching this, and that is the Texas Longhorns who, for the record, all of the Are computers back. absolutely loved last year as well. Texas, a 3.4 point, so we'll just round up and say Texas, a 3.5 point favorite on a neutral field over the second best team in the Big 12 in Oklahoma. They are a 7.5 point favorite over Kansas State and TCU on a neutral field, as you see both the two teams that participated in the Big 12 title game last year. One of the best Big 12 title games we've ever had. Really the, last two, the last two years, we've gotten some bangers, and, and by the way, neither have featured Texas or Oklahoma. Maybe there's something to that who knows but they are tied uh in the sp plus rankings uh, ratings excuse me at 14.5 then you see the next tier being texas tech baylor oklahoma state the newcomers central florida and then another tier that features iowa state who that number is skewed obviously with all of the gambling stuff going on and the fact that hunter deckers and jarrell brock are both gone i don't think that the sp plus takes that into account yet but nevertheless they are there in a tier with BYU, Cincinnati, and Houston, the other three newcomers, and then West Virginia and our beloved Kansas Jayhawks bringing up the rear in the Big 12. What stands out as you look at those numbers? We can't have Kansas all the way down there, can we? Come on now. I know it's Kansas, and I know they struggled at the end of last year, but we were talking off air before the show. Like, they bring a lot of people back. I mean, they got their quarterback back, Jalen Daniels. Like, he's really good. They have a very good coach who's – why am I blanking on their coach's name Lance right now? Lance from White, what, Lance Leipold, who signed the extension. Like, he's there for the long haul. Good. West Virginia is not going to be very good this year. I think like Houston's a newcomer into a conference where they're coming off losing their quarterback. I know Dana Dana Holgerson's been in this conference. He has some experience here, but well, they're breaking in a new quarterback. Cincinnati is a uh, you know, new coach in Scott Satterfield. There's some transfer stuff going on there. Like I think Kansas should be maybe above Cincinnati, maybe even a BYU. They were really okay. They weren't really good last year. They were good last year. They were fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're bringing back a lot of continuity. I don't think they're the worst team in this conference. Well, again, we talked about this yesterday. I know. The, I know. The power ratings in any form or fashion that you do in college football, history of the program matters. And we're not talking 50, 60 years. We're talking about five, 10 ish years worth of history. And until and they've been doing Orange Bowl, half, <laughs> Mark uh, Mangino, 15 no. That was 16 years ago, 07. Yeah, yeah that was a, no, but like. We've we've talked about it the last five years or so. Like, this is a program that was really, really, really bad. And then Lance Leipold kind of got them frisky two years ago. And then last year really hit the ground running in his first full offseason and season there. They just don't have – the talent isn't at a high level, but they do get the most out of it. It's just not very high-level talent. And so Mm -hmm. you see them there at the bottom. I agree with you. I mean, if if we want to just start quickly at the bottom – I'd put them ahead of West Virginia. I'd put them ahead of Cincinnati, who I think is really, really going to struggle. Cincinnati lost a ton of players. And we'll start from the bottom up there because I know you had some realignment hot takes. So let's start before we get into it. And I'll do my whole diatribe about is Texas back or not. We have the newcomers. We have UCF, BYU, Cincinnati, and Houston. Uh, I would flip flop. 
I think Houston and BYU is pretty negligible in the difference. I think Cincinnati is going to struggle yeah. the most out of the gate. I do think that Central Florida is the best of the bunch coming Agreed. in because they have the most talent coming back across the board uh, compared to the other teams in uh, that are coming into the Big 12. But as you just – of the newcomers, what do you expect this year just in 2023 alone? I mean, I expect a lot of them to struggle, not necessarily because they're not good programs or don't belong, but I just think they're in – not some great spots. They're coming off years of where they're losing a whole lot of talent. I do think UCF's going to be the best team. I think they have, uh, well, I think he's proved that he's not an elite head coach. I do think Gus Malzahn is still a pretty solid head coach. And I think they have the most probably stability and continuity coming back and leading them uh, into this conference this year. So I'm, I am highest on them. The, the Cincinnati one too. I, I, that's a good program. And I think Scott, Scott Satterfield's a fine coach, but like, they're losing a really darn good head coach in Luke Fickle. Like you said, a lot of transfer talents out the door. They lost some talent to the draft. I think that's going to be a little bit more of a rebuilding process um, than they're planning for, especially making the jump into a power five conference from the American. So those are, again, no, no faults of those programs own. It's not a knock on their programs. You're saying they can't hang in the big 12. I just think this is a tough year for a lot of those programs to make that transition because they're not bringing back veteran squads. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Cincinnati thing, I'm not a huge fan of the Satterfield hire. He He's fine. It's it's colored by the fact that his Louisville tenure wasn't very good. He wasn't very popular. And then at the end, he seen he had secured a really good recruiting class and it looked like he had saved his job. And then he bolts for the Cincinnati gig. I think yeah. that's a downgrade there. Houston Donovan Smith has got the job at quarterback. He was at Texas Tech. He's a guy who is a very, very low floor, very, not very, he's a very low floor, high ceiling guy. He had some really bright moments at Texas Tech and some really I kind of forgot moments. he ended up at Houston. Yeah, you mentioned Dan Holgerson's got the experience yeah. of coaching in the Big 12 at West Virginia. Maybe that'll help, maybe it won't. BYU, I like that program. I like what Kalani Sataki has done with that program. Again, I just think there's a lot of turnover there as well. And then John Rice Plumley. I mean, what's not to love about the guy? He is the ultimate showman. He is the ultimate like personality for the sport of college football. Yeah. I don't know if he's dynamic enough as a thrower to really impact things, but in a league where there's a lot of question marks, I think across the board, I, I do think there's a potential for central Florida to be the surprise team in this league. They're the only ones of the newcomers that I think at least are going to really make a run. If any of them are going to make a run this year towards contention in this. Yeah. League. I'd agree. I think they have, of the newcomers by far the best chance they could run a, com uh, a conference championship game. I don't think they're going to end up doing it, but I think they're the one team that might be hanging around till we get there. So the question that always hangs over the head, every time we talk about the big 12, every single year, this is the last time we'll have to talk about it in the big 12. We will have to talk about it next year in the sec. But the question is always is Texas back at the beginning of, of the show. We told you, of course, we're, we're back. Man, they have three elite quarterbacks on the roster. What are we talking about here? <laughs> they, they might have the best quarterback room in the country. Who knows? Um, but here's the thing. So we talked about, we, we showed the graphic earlier. They are at least according to Bill Connolly from ESPN, a three and a half point favorite over the second best team in the league, Oklahoma on a neutral field. And you know me, I'm a fatalist when it comes to sports in general, uh, particularly with this Texas program over the last 14 years now at this point yeah i'd it's love to go been... back and listen to the show before they played alabama last year and... oh i mean I, I completely whiffed on that and the, the crazy I don't blame me is... for thinking that way though because yeah. that's a lot of times how phil and i talked about notre dame entering big games but here's the thing okay i'm a fatalist when it comes to texas football and i will say that i won't drink the kool-aid necessarily because part of my brain won't allow me to but if i'm thinking objectively about this team this is a team that should be very very good this year they should I, win the conference they should win the conference i'll get to that in a second i think because they have the road game at alabama which is a winnable game don't think they're going to go on the road and win i wouldn't predict it if the line stays at seven or around seven i might advocate taking texas i advocate taking alabama in that game last year so alabama's gonna win by 30 but because they have that road game with alabama that means and they're probably going to lose that game then I think it's difficult for Texas to make the playoff because they would have to run the table in the Big 12 after that point because we've never seen a two-loss team make the playoff. That said, there are no excuses for Steve Sarkeesian anymore at Texas. Texas not winning the Big 12 this year, in my mind, represents a failure. Here's why. Let's talk about what's good for Texas. Last year, 
the same five players started all 13 games on the offensive line, and all of them are back. DJ That's Campbell, huge. who was the number one offensive line recruit in the country the year before, he wasn't even part of that equation. He should get more reps this year. So it's a, a unit that could get a lot better than what was a pretty solid unit last year. The wide receiver group last year was terrible, and they should be a lot better this year. Isaiah Nair transferred in before last season, then tore his ACL, missed the entire season. He's back. They had A.D. Mitchell from Georgia, who's a very talented player as well. Jonte Cook was a five-star recruit. Ryan Niblett is a guy who Steve Sarkeesian mentioned twice in his press conference the other day, which I thought was interesting. He's a four-star freshman. They add that group to Xavier Worthy, who's one of the best in the country, although he does struggle with drops. Jordan Whittington, who is a very, very solid player, a guy who I think can do a lot more than just play wide receiver. And JT Sanders, who I think is the best human tight end in college football because I maintain that Brock Bowers is an alien. So I think JT Sanders is a potential first-round draft pick there. The strength of this team might be their defensive line. They did lose Keandre Coburn and Moro Ojomo up front, but Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy are guys who can clog up the middle. Baron Sorrell is a guy who could take a leap at defensive end. I was talking to someone today who said that this Texas defensive front could be scary good. And they also have a lot of experience and a lot of depth at cornerback, which is important. So what don't they have? What are the question marks surrounding this team? First off, it's experience at running back, right? You lose yeah. Bijan Robinson, you lose Roshan Johnson. You were legend, Roshan Johnson. Elite guys. However, Jonathan Brooks could be the next great Texas running back. Jaden Blue and Keelan Robinson are good changes of pace. And then CJ Baxter was the number one recruit in the country at running back. He's another guy who factors into the equation there. And then depth at linebacker and safety, Jalen Ford, the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year coming in preseason. They don't have a lot of proven depth behind them. And they need Jalen Catalan, who is a freshman All-American at Arkansas and that has been hurt for a couple years. They need him to stay healthy. But if the big question marks in terms of depth are at linebacker and safety, those are probably places where you can get by with less depth than others. So this is a team that's loaded. So the pass rush covers up those warts. It does. Not totally, but for how good Texas's offense is, it covers those warts up enough, or at least on paper it should. So there's a lot to like about this team. And I hate to be that guy. But, the, but for Texas, it's going to come down to what they get from Quinn Ewers at the quarterback position. He showed flashes early on in that Alabama game, and then he got I hurt. I can't he believe he got that. hurt. He I think they win back. that game if he doesn't. I so truly do. I'm not. I'm not just trying to stoke no. the tires here. I, I, I mean, do I think, think they win that game. It's very possible. You know, we'll see what Alabama would have done to adjust. But he showed flashes against Alabama, got hurt. Came back against Oklahoma, although Oklahoma punted on that game. He looked really good. And then from there, it was a steady decline down the rest of the season. Some of it might have been had to do with his injury. Some of it might have had to do with the fact that he just lost some development time on the field. Some of it might have had to do with the fact that teams just kind of saw what he did well and adjusted and he wasn't good enough to Mm -hmm. improve. Steve Sarkeesian's calling card, the one thing he's been able to hang his hat on his entire career as a coach is his ability to call plays on offense and develop quarterbacks. The recruiting services don't miss on quarterbacks at this level very often. This was a guy who is one of the elite high school quarterback recruits that has ever been tracked in the 2025 years that recruiting has really, really been a thing. So if Steve Sarkeesian can't turn Quinn Ewers into the quarterback that people thought he was going to be coming into college, I think it says a lot about both of them. More so about Steve Sarkeesian and what would you say you do here? Like, what would you say you're doing well? They're building a good roster to go to the SEC, but they've got to translate that into wins. And it starts with what Steve Sarkeesian can get out of Quinn Ewers. And also, how do they handle adversity? They haven't been very good in one-score games under Steve Sarkeesian. He tends to get a little tight. He tends to struggle a little bit. Texas has blown a lot of leads under Steve Sarkeesian. Can they finally get going in that direction? If they can, they are going to win this league because they are the most talented team in this league. And they probably have the fewest question marks or Across their roster in this league so like i said earlier if texas does not win the big 12 this year there is no way to describe it other than a failure i think that's all very well said obviously you know take a deep breath there <laughs> uh you know more than more about texas football than i possibly could ever hope to imagine but I, I i'm with you they bring back so much talent obviously the losses at running back are a thing but like if there's one position that you're going to lose in college football or football in general that you can kind of replace uh, especially when you have that good of an offensive line it is the running back it's going to come down to Quinn Ewers are we going to see the Quinn Ewers that 
started the year and looked great against Alabama and obviously, like you said, against Oklahoma, even though Oklahoma kind of gave up? Or is it going to be the back half uh, version of Quinn Ewers that really, really struggled at times? Um, and Steve Sarkeesian's going to have to grow up too. He's going to have to learn to kind of shake out those demons of closing out games, figuring out how to manage the clock the right way and taking care of leads. They should win this conference. And I know you mentioned that like, if there's seven and a half point or seven point underdogs against Alabama, I'm not only taking Texas, I'm like to cover, I'm probably sprinkling their money line too. Like the fact that this is week two and I, Alabama is going to have so many questions at the quarterback position. I mean, you look at what they got going on there. Like that's, that's a winnable game for Texas. And it's really weird to say 365 days later, after we were talking about how they got to host Alabama and how they're probably going to get throttled, they were talking about how that's, that's going to be a winnable game for them. But if they win that game, not only should they win the big 12, they should probably be a college football playoff team. Yeah. Just kind of looking at, at if you go by ESP and SP plus again, you know, my thoughts, well, we'll go into my thoughts on Alabama, mm-hmm. how their priors certainly make them make the outlook look rosier. Uh, six and a half is actually not enough points right now, according to what uh, SP Plus says. But I don't know. I think if you look at the eye test for what Texas can do, really, I think with Bo Davis, their defensive line coach in particular, he likes to build nasty defensive lines. And that's going to be one of the strengths of this team that's going to really allow them, I think, to really, really take it to a lot of the other teams in this league. So, and then the offense, I'm excited to see what this offensive line can do in another year under Kyle Flood. A lot of talent there. They brought in an absolutely insane class. There's depth everywhere. And then the receiving room, like I said, was kind of a mess. And I'm excited to see what those guys can do. For the other outgoer, the other deserter in the Big 12, you have Oklahoma, a team who's coming off a really bizarre year last year. Yeah, uh, had a couple of high profile ass kickings go against them. They got destroyed by TCU in a game in which Dylan Gabriel was hurt because Dylan Gabriel was hurt. They kind of punted on the Texas game last year, which was, was so weird. Our choice that they really were just like, well, we're not going to win this game. So let's just get on with it and take our ass kicking and go on. When you kind of break down this roster, as, as I kind of look through it, <laughs> the thing they have going for them is Dylan Gabriel. Dylan Gabriel's really good. And he had a really, really good last year when he was healthy. Again, they were kind of out of sight, out of mind because of some of those blowout losses. But when he was healthy, he was really good. He and Jeff Levy, you know, Jeff Levy is still there. They have that connection from when they were at Central Florida together, uh, play, or when they were playing for Lane Kiffin um, together at some point. No, Lane Kiffin, sorry. They were at Central Florida, then Levy went to Ole Miss, went with yeah. Lane Kiffin. Nevertheless, they, they have continuity there. Otherwise, though, it's a strange kind of – it's a roster that's in transition, really. They they don't really have a lot of proven players at wide receiver. They don't really have any proven players at running back, although there's a lot of talent in their running back room. And the offensive line's replacing three starters. On defense, reading the opinions of people who cover the Oklahoma team, it kind of felt like Brett Venables – was really stubborn last year and refused to kind of call his defense to the personnel he had. He wanted to call the defense. He just, he wanted to run his defense without the bigger defensive linemen that he likes to have in that position. They brought in four defensive line transfers this mm-hmm. year. Uh, the, a guy they're really excited about uh, is Desan McCullough who transfers. He's, from he's Indiana. a good player. He's a, and he's a guy who can kind of play all over the field. He played safety. He's played some safety. He's played some linebacker. He's a guy who you should expect to kind of to be a – He plays Swiss defense. Knife. Yes, he plays defense. Exactly. He's a guy who they expect to be kind of a Swiss Army knife player for them. But I just can't escape the feeling in my head that this is a team that, again, like I said, just kind of feels still a little transitional. I – I think that's a fair point. I think defensively they'll have to get a little bit better this year. And I think they will, because I think while Brett Venables was probably stubborn and and trying to do what he does, that is what he does. And I think he probably has another year to get in the guys that he wants to bring in. I know the defensive line saw a bunch of transfers come in. And I think that's kind of what you start to see, especially on a a head coach's side of the ball. The second year is they kind of start to get the guys into the program that they want, but there's also a just Oklahoma's in a weird position because there's just, so much pressure on them this year, I think, especially going into the SEC, how they played last year. Lincoln Riley obviously gone now. This is the second year. Like last year, you, it, it, they'll use the excuse of, you know, new head coach, new system, all that. There's no excuses anymore. And you can't go into the SEC with this lack of momentum. You can't go in after going, what was it, seven and six last year, six and seven, were they, whatever. And then, you know, if you have another clunker of a year where you're seven and six again, 
you're going to start losing recruiting battles. You're going to have whispers that Brett Venables isn't the guy. And quite honestly, if he goes seven and six again, there might be more than whispers that he's not the guy. There's a ton of pressure on them to over to perform this year. And it's a pressure that just hasn't really existed in, at Oklahoma for a while because it was just always a given that they're the best team in that conference. Um, I'm interested to see how they play with that pressure, how Brett Venables coaches with that pressure, how Dylan Gabriel plays a quarterback with that pressure, because it exists this year more than it really has. And as long as I can remember. Yeah. They got blown out by TCU in Texas. They lost seven by Kansas state. Their other, they lost, four, they lost to West Virginia. They did. Their other four losses were all by three points each. So yeah, West Virginia loss, a loss, Texas tech, a, a bowl game, which to their credit, I don't, you know, I'm not a big, like you make, uh, you, you really build off of a bowl game in terms of your opinion of a team. But I will say Florida State was a team with a ton of hype, a team that you figured would be amped up to try to use that bowl game as mm-hmm. motivation to build towards this year. And Oklahoma acquainted themselves pretty well in that game. So we'll yeah. see. I still think that they're probably okay if this year's still a bit transitional. If they can turn some of those one-score games in their favor, if they win like eight or nine games and they continue to build, they had a really good recruiting class last year. I still think it's kind of trying to build themselves up to be able to contend in the SEC. And I think that's just turning over the roster to fit what Brenton Venables wants to do. Yeah. I think it'll be a big eye test team too. Like last year, they just didn't pass the eye test a lot of times. If they go eight and four or whatever it is, eight and five with a bowl game loss, but like you see a little bit of a different aspect. This team, obviously they don't get blown out twice. They're losing maybe closer games. They're winning some games. They're, they're figuring out how to win games late as opposed to losing them a little bit more often. Maybe you have a little bit more excitement going into the SEC. Um, but for me, it's going to be kind of a, you're going to know it when you see it with them, I think, this year. So there are two teams sitting there saying, why are you guys spending so much time talking about teams that aren't going to be here? We played for the conference title last year. The defending champions in the Big 12 are the Kansas State Wildcats. If you, you have been living under a rock, you might not know that Chris Kleiman, he came from North Dakota State. And what does North Dakota State like to do, Matt? They, they like, like to, to win championships. You. They like to win championships, and they like to beat you up on the line of scrimmage. Uh, Kansas State returns all five offensive linemen from the Big 12 championship team, a group of guys who all came back together to say, we want to prove that this is not a fluke. Uh, Will Howard, if Will Howard doesn't regress to the quarterback he was before last year, they're going to be right back in the conversation again. Uh, they do lose uh, They do lose Deuce. They lose Malik Knowles. They lose Cade Warner. So they lose some skill position guys, but you know they're going to be physical. If Will Howard is good, they're going to be good up front and you know they're going to be good on offense. They do lose a couple of top two-round picks in Anaduke Azoma and Julian Brents. Uh, only four starters back on defense, so this offense is going to have to carry them while their defense begins mm-hmm. to gel. We do have an interesting early schedule. Uh, Troy's a nice kind of warm-up game in week two for them. Uh, Troy's a team who was very, very stingy last year. Doesn't have the horses to run with them, probably. But a team that's that's a good warm up game. Uh, then they go to Missouri. They go to cent- they play Central Florida at home again. We talked about how good that offense could potentially be. Then they have road games at Oklahoma State and Texas Tech. They're they're j- thrown right into the fire early yeah. this year at Kansas State. But again, they're just so remarkably solid. They're very well coached. And if Will Howard continues to progress or at least plays the baseline he established when he came in and replaced Adrian Martinez. There's no reason not to think that this team's going to be right there again. Yeah. I mean, if you have the quarterback and you have the offensive line and you play the style that Kansas state likes to, like you said, returning offensive line kind of beat you up up front. You don't have to. Excuse me. I was getting a phone call there on my computer. Um, (laughs) You don't have to worry as much about the quarterback or you don't have to worry as much about the skill position because you already have that identity and you trust you can build that identity on the backs of your offensive line, your quarterback defensively, they're going to have a lot to figure out. Uh, They have kind of two games ish to do it uh, before. I'm sorry. Who'd you say their third game was Missouri, which uh, maybe maybe three, depending if it's a tough road game, but still Missouri's Missouri. They're going to have to figure it out kind of fast. And like you said, their conference schedule isn't exactly easy um, to start things off, but I love the identity of that program. I love the head coach of that program. And when you're bringing back, you know, all five starters on the offensive line, simply because they want to prove that it wasn't a, you know, a fluke that they can do this again, I I tend to trust what they have building there. So I I like Kansas state. I think they're a step below Texas, obviously Uh, they have some, they're going to have to integrate some new pieces and do it fast. But I also trust that head coach and that system, because obviously it's different talk about FCS, but like North Dakota state, 
was a factory. They lost ta- they lost talent a lot. They filled talent in. And again, you're not getting that elite talent. I guess FCS elite talent. You're not getting that level of elite talent in Kansas State. But you know how to integrate new pieces and you know how to do it fast to keep yourself playing at an elite level. So I like Kansas State this year. Yeah, I- I'm with you. I, they also, they do get TCU at home. They do have to go to Texas, which weirdly because when i know it's funny because in the aughts when i was you know in school and shortly after i graduated kansas state was kind of like the boogeyman for texas they could not beat them but texas actually kind of owned kansas state in recent years which is just kind of a flip on how that's gone and they do have to go to austin a game where they were kind of physically dominated at home by texas and then texas tried to blow up because that's what they do so we'll see there the team that's a fantastic do- uniform matchup by the way texas and kansas state either way either way I-, I would probably say i like the purple versus our white but you know it see is- i kind of go the i went the other way you know, but i still like both our IC whites vince young called them the IC whites and those I was- are they might be the they're IC- top three uniform in college football and uh, you can put you can have one two or three i wouldn't tell you you're wrong it's so good. Uh, the then and we've now gone for 26 minutes, and we haven't, Matt, talked about the team that played for a national championship game, played in the national championship game last year. We, for their sake and the sake of their fans, will not discuss what happened in said national title game. We will just like to pretend that TCU season ended after they beat Michigan. And the first note I wrote down was they can't do it again, right? The all-time positive variance team, they lost a ton of talent. And if you look at Sonny Dykes' coaching history, his teams haven't always followed kind of an upward linear uh, path. Uh, There have been bumps in the road throughout his time. But again, you lose Quentin Johnston, you lose Max Duggan, you lose the running backs, you lose D. Winters, the heart and soul of that defense, you lose Travian Hodges Tomlinson, who won the the, uh, Thorpe Award last year. There's a lot gone, and everything seemed to go there and not everything seemed to everything went their way through the regular season it didn't really matter what happened every break title game they they didn't get the last break in the big 12 title game when duggan was banged up and they couldn't get the ball in the end zone everything went their way against michigan and then they kind of splattered got splattered in the title game but whatever nevertheless everything went their way it just seems like it can't go again i will say chandler morris he did win the job last year he was going to be their starting quarterback and then he got hurt and then max duggan took off and never looked back so at least they have that going for them they do bring in some transfers jp richardson from oklahoma state at wide receiver they do bring in a couple of uh, transfers from alabama running back trey sanders wide receiver jojo earl so they hit the portal hard and that's kind of what he did last year but they, su- they, they supplemented a decently experienced roster last year with some portal guys. They're not going to be as decently experienced. They do have seven starters back on defense, but lost a lot of guys there. I do like Joe Gillespie, the coordinator, but I mean, like I said, they can't do this again, right? No, uh, they. I don't think they can. I would be very surprised if they did. I mean, the good news with TCU is if you look at their schedule, they open up at home against Colorado. They'll, they'll beat Colorado, Nichols State. They go to Houston, but I, I, I don't. I'm not super high on Houston this year. I think TCU is probably a better football team than them. Houston's going to have a tough time adapting. I think this year they go. They host SMU again. SMU is coming up losing Tanner Mordecai. They host West Virginia. West Virginia. I don't think either of us are high on. They go to Iowa State. Like we were talking about, that program's kind of in flux right now. Then they host BYU. So neither of us are all that uh, high on BYU with the amount of turnover there is. There's a decent chance that we're talking about them as like a six and one football team at the midway point in the year. The bad news is after that BYU game, they go to Kansas State. They go to Texas Tech, who were both, I think, pretty high and at least offensively can put up a bunch of points. They host Texas. They host Baylor. Then they go to Oklahoma. So they could start like six and one, and then they could very easily end up seven and five, six and six. Um, I don't, I know they brought in talent and they hit the portal hard, but. They lost a lot last year, a lot of high-end talent. Max Duggan was a Heisman finalist. Quentin Johnson was a first-round draft pick. Kendra Miller was a huge part of their offense last year. Uh, Travis Hodges Tomlinson, like, yeah, Travis Hodges Tomlinson was a really good corner for them last year. Steve Avila was on the offensive line. He was very good for them. Like, they got a lot of new pieces to get in very, very quickly. And like you said, Sonny Dykes, as good as a, as good of a job as he did last year, like they relied on winning a lot of coin flips and they won just about every coin flip except for the big 12 championship game. When it turned out that coin flip was fairly irrelevant. Um, He hasn't historically been able to make these turnarounds all that quickly. And I just, the schedule is going to do him some favors early, but I'm, I'm worried about what happens late when they kind of run into an absolute buzzsaw of a schedule to finish out their season. 
I will say this. I know we, you and I both like Tanner Mordecai and think that that was a good pickup for Wisconsin. The way I understand it, nobody at SMU was was shedding any tears about losing him because they are really, really high on Preston Stone, the guy who's replacing him. That's a great uh, quarterback a, name. It's a great – and it's such an SMU, Highland Park, Texas, yeah. Dallas, Preston Stone. I mean, come on. There might not be a better like name for a quarterback playing for a particular program. Really it's agreed. Like, playing for texas like preston stone playing for smu is just somehow perfect yeah uh, so and there's some doubts over the future of that rivalry as well so there's some things going on there that game is always intense and that's going to be a good barometer for them and you can't for you and, and like we can't we can't i guess skip over the fact that hey they might have the most interesting second most interesting week one game i think florida state lsu is in a runaway is the most interesting week one game but the second most interesting week one game might be tcu in colorado it might not be interesting but it, it, the, one of the most interesting, interesting but it'll have a ton of eyeballs it's not going to be good it's it's yeah. interesting because one it, it's an inter, it's a very interesting game yeah fair enough interesting matchup there's a lot of there's a wide range of potential outcomes in that game i do think that TCU just clobbering them is very much on the table, obviously, but that would be interesting in and of itself. I think if you, yeah. that's what happens, I Fair think enough. that's kind of what enough. you expect, but it is interesting nonetheless. The buzzy team, the team that I think is the Texas Tech Red Raiders, they might as well not be the Red Raiders this year. They might as well be the Texas Tech Yellow Jackets because the buzz surrounding that team has gotten a bit out of control. Thank you for rolling your eyes. That, that was, was I know I liked it. That was fun. That was good. I, was I liked so it. Proud of that line. It was so sometimes bad. you can get cheesy, but sometimes cheesy yeah. has, oh, has, be, has a place. But yeah, but sometimes cheesiness has a place, and it had a place here. That was good. I, I'm going to be honest. I've kind of gotten uncomfortable with the level to which people are hyping the Texas Tech program. We look. Joey McGuire had a great year one. But they won a lot of close games last year. That was they kind did. of their mo. He was the gunslinger. He was the uh, he was the riverboat gambler. The Texas game they went for like 500 fourth downs and got all of them. Like they had a really really exciting fun year to build upon. Uh, Tyler Shuck is the quarterback again. He's a guy who's been hurt a ton. Uh, they have a revamped offensive line. They have good skill position players. They have experience on defense, but they do obviously lose Tyree Wilson, who was a breakout player for them. Uh, we'll know what this team is early on. I, that They start the season, one of the weirdest schedule spots of the season, they start the season on the road at Wyoming, which is a really weird game and not one that I would overlook if I were them before. Again, we're going to get a really good test of how good this team is when they take on Oregon. I understand the pieces are there. I like Zach. I mean, Kitley's a really, really good offensive coordinator, a really good, bright young mind who will be a head coach sooner than later. But other than the Mike Leach years, this is a program that has never sustained any significant level of success. So for people to expect that this team is going to be in the Big 12 title game or be right there, and Brett McMurphy ranked them 11th in the preseason. That's, preseason that's too much. I just like, I, I think that this is a program that's better when they're floating kind of in the middle and able to kind of sneak up on people. And if they build some hype, particularly if they beat Oregon, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs in the, on them and a lot of, and a big target on them. I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing for Texas Tech. No, I, I, you're right. It is a program that's better off when they're kind of the sneaky, you don't see us coming type program. I just think they're, I think they're really well coached, and I think they're a little bit deeper. They're a little bit more than just what Mike Leach was at the air raid. They're not going to ground and pound you to death, but they can run the football a little bit more. They bring back receiver talent. They have a quarterback in Tyler Shuck, who I know he hasn't played a ton due to injury, but he's been around college football for, I swear to God, it's been like 10 years now. Um I just I, I kind of like what they're building there, and as as much as they might not be sneaking up on teams, they're still not seen by most people as a top, you know, three to four team in that conference, anyways. Because I think most people are saying Texas, Oklahoma is going to have that you know, be a top be seen as a top team by default. I think a lot of people are high on Kansas State. I still think they might be in a little bit of a position to kind of, excuse me, sneak up on some people. I also think their schedule. Where I know you said Wyoming, but. They got to host. They can't, they can't look past Wyoming. I still think they win that game. Oregon, I don't think they win, but then they host Tarleton State, whoever the hell that is. Uh, they go to West Virginia. They host Houston. They go to Baylor, who's kind of retooling things. Like the conference schedule does line up for them okay early. Um, hey, don't doubt Tarleton State's going to be FBS before you know it. They're a pretty young program, but they are invested in trying to be, build a football program there. That's good. Um, the Another team in the state of Texas that 
kind of a big unknown this year, is going to be the Baylor Bears. I think we were big fans of Dave Aranda, and then that I still am. But he's planted last year, and it was weird. Um, Blake Shapin needs to be more consistent. He's a guy who has shown flashes, but he's also been not so consistent throughout the last year. There were just a lot of mistakes he shouldn't have made. Richard Reese leads a really talented running back room. So they're going to be a team that's going to want to be able to run the ball. The question is going to be how well are they going to with a offensive line that only returns one starter? Again, when you play in a league that's got some defensive talent and you have to play teams like Texas on the schedule, you're going to need to be good up front. And if they can't run the ball well and take the pressure off of Shappen, or uh, shaping, excuse me, then that's a problem for them. Uh, defensively, they weren't that good last year, but they bring in Matt Pallage, who used to be their safeties coach, to take over the defense, which leads me to believe that Aranda bringing in a guy he's familiar with, he's going to want to kind of be hands on with that defense. Yeah. And hope they're going to be better, which I think is a good thing, obviously, because that's his bread and butter. Uh, but they didn't really do anything well on defense last year. And it's kind of another make or I don't know, make or break kind of year. But it's going to be an interesting year for Dave Aranda to kind of to kind of rebuild his stock after Baylor was a bit of a letdown last year. Yeah, I, I, it was they were a letdown. I'm still fairly high on them. I think they're a team that's going to play hard. And I think him getting back and being a little bit more hands on with the defense is probably going to be a little bit more a little bit helpful for them. Like you said, the key for them is the offensive line. They're replacing so many starters. They're a team that loves to run the football. They have a quarterback that is not an elite. He's has experience. He's not an elite quarterback by any means. He's going to need more time back there. The offensive line coming together is probably going to be the key. It is going to be the key to their season. Having to do that fast, not necessarily always a bad thing. If you have to replace offensive line, especially if you're replacing offensive linemen that struggled, um, but they're the guys that are coming in, they better hope have had pretty solid off seasons and have taken pretty good steps to get themselves to be, you know, that starting spot. So there's only one other team, I believe that we haven't addressed in some form or fashion in this league. And really it's just kind of a shrug emoji from me. And that's the Oklahoma state Cowboys. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> wanted to make that. I wanted to make them my preseason or my, my bet of their over win total of six and a half, just because that seems like, like Gundy does, but they're too much. There's way too many unknowns going on there. Just there, there's so much that's up in the air with them. Well, so that's the thing. Like they lost a lot of talent. They portaled in a lot of guys. Alan Bowman, who was at Michigan and then Texas Tech, is the quarterback. Which sure, okay. Uh, they have a new defensive coordinator who Gundy pulled out of the Division Two football because that's a thing that he likes to do. They're consistently decent every year, and they're due for some positive injury regression at some point because they've really struggled with injuries the last couple of years. They were really, really banged up all season last year. Uh, I will say to the point of your bet of playing there over, they got a the they got a uh, sorry you're losing bedlam uh, care package from the Big 12 Conference this year. They don't play Texas. They don't play Texas Tech. They don't play TCU. They don't. They have play, a nice schedule. They don't play Baylor. They play all of the. They play all four of the newcomers to the league, and they get Kansas State and Oklahoma at home. You want to talk about one of the most charged, maybe the most charged atmosphere in college football this year? The potentially last for a very, very long time bedlam game. Granted, it is a rivalry that Oklahoma has completely dominated. The old yeah. adage is Oklahoma might win by a little. They might win by medium. They might win by a lot. But Oklahoma is almost always going to win Bedlam. Nevertheless, that stadium is going to be absolutely insane for that game. So while I don't think they've got the talent to push for the Big 12 title this year, I think the schedule is favorable enough for them where they are a team that should be able to win a bunch of games this year. And while you give your thoughts on them, I've got to look up their schedule again real quick. I, I got I got it open. I can read it for you if you want. They're non-conference. They're non they, they're at home against Central Arkansas. They when? go to they go to Arizona State, which I mean, I guess that's that really could be that that's both teams are kind of in similar I guess arenas for me, like I'm not really sure what to expect out of both of them. Granted, if Drew Pine ends up starting for Arizona State, I, I think, think they're going to mount the marks this year. Week two of the Kenny Dillingham era at Arizona State, even though it is in Tempe, I'm going Oklahoma State there. Yeah, I think I take the consistency there. They host South Alabama, who's had some success as a program, but I, I think that's a game that Mike Gundy wins at home. I just say mm -hmm. he's a good college football coach who's always had, gotten his teams ready. Uh, they go to Iowa State, like we said. That's an interesting program to say the least right now. Then they got can they got Kansas State at home, Kansas at home, go to West Virginia, host Cincinnati, host Oklahoma, 
to UCF to Houston at home against BYU. It's a win. It's it's not a bad schedule. It's, it's a it's a thanks for hanging around from the Big Twelve kind of schedule. Yeah, like that's the thing, man. And like I don't know that they're going to be any good. They might be good. They might be bad. I, but God, the schedule is so. So I, th- sweet for I think Mike Gundy is a good enough coach and a consistent enough coach to get, I'm, and I'm still not going to make it my bet. Um, but I think he's a good enough and a consistent enough f- college football coach with enough experience coming back to get them to that seven, maybe eight win mark against this kind of cakewalky of a schedule. Uh, oh man. Ah oh, man. Uh, They're over six and a half is minus minus one fifteen on DraftKings. I don't love that, but fudge, fudge. Um, okay, I think so we have to we've take kind of it. covered everything we need to cover. Uh, no, I'm not giving out the Kansas win total over again this year. That was a cake. That By the way, I changed my I changed my bet already throughout the show. Oh, okay. Well, then hit me. Uh, I was going to take Texas Tech's win win total over seven and a half at plus money, but I tend to agree with some of that. We we talked my we talked me through that a little bit. <laughs> Uh, I still think they do get there, but I think it one. It, I think there's there's a reason it's plus money. I think DraftKings and Vegas are trying to get me to take that, and I think there's a very realistic scenario that they end up as like a seven and five team this year, but is still very fun and still has a successful year. Eight wins for a program like Texas Tech is a lot of wins, and that's not a knock on them. That's just that's given the consistencies of their program throughout the years. That's a lot of wins. That's a very good season for them. I'm going Dylan Gabriel over 3,025 and a half passing yards. Ooh, I love that. I think that number – by the way, I, I don't want to get too far into this, but I've been looking on DraftKings and, like, they got some low numbers for those people. Like Sam Hartman, not to be Notre Dame homer, but he's, like, 2950. He's thrown for, like, 3,700-plus, and every year he's been a starter. Like, I, I don't – I know Notre Dame likes to run the football, but they're going to throw more this year, especially since they have him. There's some oddly low numbers on DraftKings, but – Dylan Gabriel, he's started four years in his career, 2019 UCF, 13 games, 36-53. 2020 UCF in 10 games, 35-70. Last year at Oklahoma in 12 games, even when he was hurt, 31-68. Like, I don't know. I think that's a really low number, and I think what Oklahoma does, even when they have a running game, they still have a quarterback. They still love to throw the ball around the yard. Jeff Levy likes to throw the ball around the yard. Give me over 30, 25 and a half for Dylan Gabriel at uh, minus 115. So for mine, um, I just did something stupid and. Hell yeah. I um, love when we do stupid stuff on this show. That's what the people so love. Here's the thing. I told you I'm not a huge believer. In, I, I'm interested in what Oklahoma's got going on, but I think they're transitional. I think that Texas very much. You bet Texas to win the league, national championship. Like, Texas. If you don't want to trust Texas. So I was kind of thinking of ways that you could fade those teams. And God love FanDuel. They have conference exactas mm. uh, where you can pick a team to beat other team. And I did Kansas State to beat Texas in the conference championship game. I didn't pull the trigger. Uh, I didn't add this to the card just now, but Kansas State to beat Oklahoma State is 110 to 1. And then just like Oklahoma State sneaking in on a really soft schedule is a possibility. He said, do I have Kansas State beating Texas to win the conference championship? I do. However, I have created a synthetic market. Are you familiar with the concept of dutching? Explain it to me. Dutching is when you make a bet and you alter the, the, the stake to, uh, to fit the, the size of the, the, the bet itself. So that way you create a synthetic market. So, for example. I have created a market, which is Kansas State to beat Texas or or Oklahoma in the conference title game at plus 1148. So roughly plus 1150 for Kansas State to beat Oklahoma or Texas. So basically what this is, is Kansas State to beat. So you're basically betting two bets here. You're betting Kansas State to beat Texas, which is plus 2300. And you're betting Kansas State to beat Oklahoma, uh, which is a plus 2500. And to get the odds there. Um, it would be betting uh, 0.52 units on the Texas bet and 0.48 units. So if you're taking $100, you're betting 52 on the Texas price and 48 on the Oklahoma price to create this market. So that way you end up with an even stake in an even outcome. So Because if you flat stake both of them, mm-hmm. then you're not your odds are a little different. Does yeah. that make sense? So nevertheless, yes. 
to uncomplicate things, I have bet Kansas State to beat Texas and Kansas State to beat Oklahoma in the conference title game, plus 1148. Some of the other ones that I considered were Kansas State over Texas Tech, which is plus 9,500. Um, Kansas State to beat UCF is also 110 to 1. Um, so, yeah, so that Oklahoma State thing, man. If they show anything early on in the season that looks like they've got something going there, that might be a team that I'm interested in just because of the way the schedule sets up for them. Dan, you could oh, not have been, sure. you could not have been more right when you said we don't have the same um, conference bet, Big Twelve bet at the beginning of the podcast. Yeah, I, I knew I was going to go a little. I like my instinct was to it's take, your conference, so I like that. Well, it was my my instinct was to take the Texas Tech Kansas State prices. But mm-hmm. I was just like, I don't know if I can trust that Texas Tech is suddenly going to make the Big 12 title game uh, right now. And realistically, again, that's just me kind of being negative and trying to think. Like, I do think there's value there. I do think picking Kansas State to win this league, even though they do have questions, I don't think that's a bad play. But realistically, again, like I said at the beginning of the show, it's a failure if Texas doesn't win the league. There's enough talent there. They have the quarterback who has the pedigree that they really should be able to win that league this year. And if they don't, you really have to be able, you really have to have more questions about Steve Sarkeesian's competency in building a team that is going to win games. Now that said, they might just be good enough where they win a lot of games by where they don't have to worry about these one score margins. Mm-hmm. This year. So who knows? Oh, there was one team we didn't talk much about Iowa state. We talked about them very, very, very briefly. I don't really have any other thoughts other than like, I'm just fascinated to see what the fallout is with this gambling thing. Um, yeah, I, it's just going to be we're talking about interesting teams to watch this year. They're going to be an interesting team to watch this year. Well, I don't know how interesting they are. They're they they just how of, things unfold. Their game style is terrible, but just they, as a program, they kind of became Iowa a little bit in the fact that they were really good on defense and their offense was super dysfunctional. And that should only just get worse now that their quarterback and running back are both gone, and and Xavier Hutchinson, their wide receiver, went in the draft. So like. I don't know. I think that means it's, it's kind of wild of- how far Matt Campbell's stock has fallen. I mean, he was like, he was going to be the next Notre Dame head coach or the next Michigan head coach. And now it's, he's barely hanging on at Ohio state or Iowa state. Jesus. I think not barely hanging on, but you know what I mean? I think that he's in the right place for him. And I think probably he realizes that he's not much of a recruiter. Uh, you can't win at a place like Michigan if you don't recruit decently yeah. well. And he's just never really shown a proclivity for recruiting at a high level. He's a talent development guy. So being at a program like Iowa State where he can find diamonds in the rough and polish them into something good. And they're a program where it's going to be, okay, we're going to suffer through some lean years and we're going to build, we're going to build, build, build. And at the end of the developmental cycle, we're going to make a push for the conference. Like that's what happened. They had two teams that had pretty good experience last year. They weren't as experienced as they were the last couple of years. Like what last year wasn't as big a disappointment as the year before was like two years ago or 2020, they almost won the big 12. Mm-hmm. And in 2021, they brought back like the entire team and they ended up going like six and six or five. So I, think and it was seven and, I think they won the yeah. bowl game and went seven and six. And that was a huge disappointment. They're now in the the early part of the cycle of trying to rebuild. And that just got completely blown up by the fact they have this gambling scandal going on. So I get it. Like I, maybe his stock has fallen, but I think at a certain point, you also might have to realize there are just guys who are better in certain places. Just that than where he's places. at. Yeah. And maybe. He has the self-realization to realize that the self-actualization to say I'm better off staying here than going somewhere else. And I can kind of do things the way that I want. Cause look, man, you, you go and you win eight or nine games every three or four or five years at Iowa state. You're doing pretty you can well. You'd be at Iowa state for a long, as yeah, long I mean, as you want. Exactly. Like you can go eight and four every year at Iowa state and people are happy. You go eight and four back to back at Michigan and they're, they're asking who's next. Yeah. So maybe he's got the self-realization yeah. to be like, maybe he does. Um, Maybe I'm just a okay. I do agree that I don't think you're going to see him in the mix for bigger jobs anytime soon, but I think that uh, he's in a spot where he kind of got dealt a bad hand this year. I am no fan of Matt Campbell's. He's also a guy who really seems to struggle in, in close games. He just can't win close games and that's going to be a problem. And eventually maybe there's some positive regression there, but who knows any other thoughts on the big 12 before we wrap this up? No, it's going to be a fun conference to watch mm-hmm. though. There's going to be, 
there's going to be a lot of, I mean, it always is because I feel like it's always a pretty, uh, there's always a lot of parody in this conference, usually following the, whoever the top team is. There's usually a lot of just anybody can beat anybody on any given Saturday. And I feel like we're going to get a lot more of that this, this time around. Absolutely. It'll be fun with a few new teams in the mix. Should be really, really exciting as well. Tomorrow, I think we're going to do the ACC if we can get corporate sure. Phil on the horn. We're going to try to do it early tomorrow, I thought was the plan. Am I not mistaken there? We we'll, check in. we'll check in with Phil, but yeah, yeah we pretty, pretty should do a production tomorrow. meeting while we're live on the air. But nevertheless, we just did. So we'll probably be back ACC tomorrow. I can't wait to talk about the Pac-12. The SEC, not so much. I don't really care about the SEC. Uh, I just think the SEC is for now good. for this well, year. I think the SEC is really good for three teams. Um, yeah, for in 2023. I'm interested to see what happens at the top of the rest of the league. I'm just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Uh, ACC, spoiler alert, it's two teams, and then who's going to be a landmine and try to blow that up? And the Pac-12, I can't wait. Oh, God, it's going to be so good. Uh, but for now, that's going to do it for us. We appreciate everyone who has tuned in to check us out. We will be back tomorrow to talk about somebody. We don't know who. We don't know when. Check out our socials. You see them there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we will be posting when we are live, probably early in the morning tomorrow to talk about the conference that is going to be the ACC for Corporate Phil. Forever we see him again. For Matt, I'm Dan. We will talk to you later.